It's the morning here, but we're blessed to have participants from 60 nations at this event. CMS established the Tomasi Lecture in 2014 in order to lift up migration-related issues of pressing concern to faith communities. Father Lidio Tomasi, an Italian immigrant, was the founding member of the Center for Migration Studies, along with his brother, Archbishop Silvano Tomasi. Father Tomasi directed or co-directed the Center for Migration Studies from 1968 to 2001. During his tenure, he founded Migration World Magazine. He also edited the annual volume of In Defense of the Alien, the Proceedings of an Annual Conference on Immigrants' Rights and Immigration Policy. 42 years later, that gathering still takes place each year at Georgetown University. A distinguished sociologist, Father Tomasi received many awards, degrees, and honors. At CMS, we know him is a mentor, a friend, and a constant source of support. We're very honored that my Cardinal Michael Cherney will be delivering this year's lecture. The Vatican News has called Cardinal Cherney a cardinal for the peripheries, which well describes his life's work for the church. Cardinal Cherney is the undersecretary of the Vatican's dicastery for promoting integral human development, he was also one of two special secretaries to the Synod of Bishops for the Pan-Amazon region. Let me now turn to Father Bob Dowd to introduce Father John Jenkins, Notre Dame's president. But first, I wanted to thank Father Jenkins, Father Dowd, Therese Hanlon, and the Notre Dame team for hosting this event virtually, for their partnership with us on it, for their stellar work on it, and for the leadership that so many in the Notre Dame communities show in this area. Let me now turn to Father Dowd. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, welcome, everyone. It's uh, great to be together. And as I mentioned yesterday, Notre Dame is grateful and pleased to be co-hosting this conference with the Center for Migration Studies. And Father John Jenkins is someone who has been especially devoted to turning Notre Dame outward to ensure that the university is tackling questions that address some of the most pressing needs of our world and our church. Um, Father John isn't a big fan of long introductions of himself. <laughs> I've probably already gone on too long. Um, but Father John has also devoted himself to, to making sure that Notre Dame is an inclusive and welcoming community. And uh, although we still have more work to do, thanks to Father John, we've made a lot of progress. And Notre Dame has been a place where DACA students are especially welcome and uh, where, um, where people of various backgrounds will find a home. And that's largely thanks to, to Father John's uh, devotion, his dedication to the mission of Notre Dame. So let me just now uh, turn to Father John. Father John, President of the University of Notre Dame, Father John Jenkins. John. Thank you very much, Bob, and, and thank all of you wherever you are and whatever time zone you're in. It's great to have you at this conference. Notre Dame is honored to co-host this conference with the Center for Migration Studies. It's a great opportunity for all of us, for faculty, staff, students here on campus, and for all of us participating uh, to learn from immigrants and refugees, and also to learn from people who work shoulder to shoulder with them. I'm particularly grateful uh, to have with us uh, His Eminence Cardinal Cherney and others who will be speaking today. We're honored to have you. Thanks for your hard work and your dedication to the cause of uh, immigrants and refugees. You know, Notre Dame uh, is part of our Catholic mission to strive to welcome, to accompany, to integrate, and to be an ally with immigrants and the first generation population in this country and around the world. Uh, we recognize that there's so much more work to do, but we also know that uh, this work arises out of our mission as a Catholic university. So thanks everyone for participating in this conference. May it represent an opportunity to deepen our understanding and re rededicate ourselves to promoting respect for the God-given human dignity of each and every human being. 
So let me just uh, start off with, uh, with a brief prayer as we begin our conference. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for the opportunity you give us in this conference. Help us to listen attentively and to deepen our understanding of the experiences of your people and the challenges they face. Help us, help us to grow in compassion for those who suffer and the, and the courage to stand for the vulnerable and marginalized. May your church continue to strive to be the instrument of your healing, peace, and love. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Father John. And uh, so we'll just now turn to the Cardinal, Cardinal Cherney, please. Thank you. Thank you all. And thank you, uh, Father John, for inviting me to deliver the Father Lidio F. Tomasi annual lecture on international migration and to keynote this year's Catholic Immigrants Integration Initiative Conference. When on 9th of January you invited me, I accepted immediately. And then suddenly the whole world was engulfed by COVID-19. At the Migrants and Refugees section, we had to change how we worked while carrying on preparations for the World Day of Migrants and Refugees, which took place a week ago. So when I finally began to think about this address, the raging pandemic and human mobility were shedding puzzling and troubling light on each other. That's why the title is a paradox, mobility and lockdown, not versus. In this globally paradoxical situation, the Holy Father warns, don't try to go back but points out important ways of going forward. What he proposes is clearly Christian, definitely tough, and absolutely essential for getting on with our research, our work and ministry on behalf of vulnerable people on the move. To set the stage, I want to highlight how the pandemic alters the picture of migration. Before the winter of 2020, I would have told you that migrants can encompass people looking for a better life, refugees fleeing war, societal breakdown or climate change, internally displaced people who feel like aliens in their own country, and perhaps most shamefully of all, victims of human trafficking. To these most vulnerable displaced people on the move, God is especially close, and that's what migrants usually means. But now, displacement is true for the great majority of people the world over. Of course, they may not be on the move. Indeed, many are told to stay home. This displaces them from their normal routines. And because all the world's economies are seriously disrupted, even those who enjoy their current living arrangements face changes in what they can buy or sell or do. Stable, comfortable lives and prosperous populations are uprooted. Taking goods and services for granted, they're surprised to see them interrupted or scarce and to see the human cost involved in providing them. Accustomed to moving at will, rapidly and conveniently, they're suddenly stuck. Accustomed to consuming a great deal, they're forced to reduce or even motivated to simplify. And what about those who were on the move before COVID hit, migrant workers, refugees, and so on. When things are normal, these people, even in the best of times, do not experience what normal normally means. Normal, for many such people, is no, nowhere close to what would be generally acceptable conditions of life. Instead, they endure months and typically years of uncertainty 
acute anxiety, precarious nutrition and lodging, poor health, legal limbo, and either unemployment or the risk of exploitation and abuse if they do find something to do. Then COVID comes along. The precarious work disappears. They can't go back to their former country because borders are closed. They have to stay, but now with even less means to survive on. As governments scurry to improvise solutions and protect their own citizens, the, for the forgotten ones become doubly and even more deliberately forgotten. Think of those in crowded camps and other detention facilities where COVID can spread like wildfire. Think of those living on the streets, unable to take the most basic health precautions. Think of those who lack the means to distance socially in a safe manner, such as in slums. And think of those forced to go to work each day, lacking the luxury of home offices and Zoom calls. Those who work in the informal economy, the often invisible people who provide essential services, putting food on our tables and doing the lowest paid healthcare jobs. Next, think about how lockdown changes us and them. Prior to, the word, prior to the pandemic, we would hear the word lock in association with persons and groups who are really not like us. They, not we, need to be locked up or locked away. The them could be fellow citizens who are locked away in remote camps during wartime because we decide it's safer to mistrust all of them due to their ethnic background. Or the them could be the individuals whom we lock up in prison for all sorts of good and bad reasons. But now lockdown is imposed on everybody. Why? Because with the hazard of disease spreading uncontrollably, everybody has to go have their movements severely restricted. And that's not just for the benefit of some, it's for the common good. Suddenly we discover that there is just one category. Everyone belongs to we and us. And the restrictions, the difficult restrictions are for everyone's good, the common good. Isn't this like the discovery that climate is a worldwide phenomenon that affects everyone? as Pope Francis said five years ago, and all of us must care for our common home. Let me now talk about what the Holy Father teaches us about the pandemic. He reminds us that during times of great anxiety and suffering, we need to amend, to reform, to renew the threefold relationships that define human life with God, with our neighbor and with all creation. Like every serious injustice, sickness or suffering, COVID-19 is a wake up call to amend our lives, our attitudes and our social interactions. In the words of Laudato Si, it is an invitation to be more attentive to the double cry of the earth and of the poor. The Holy Father has given us a rich collection of teachings over the past half year, uh, for the, over the past half year under COVID, reflecting on the injustices that it exposes and what we need to do for a post COVID world. Let me suggest that the Holy Father dwells on the following seven key themes. We must put the common good above self-centeredness, we must reject indifference, invisibility, and individualism. Don't ignore and don't forget. Don't foster divisions. Don't be hypocrites. We knock uh, an economic model based on greed, zeal for profit, 
and instant graphic gratification is not reliable, merely technical solutions aren't reliable either. Let me touch briefly on what he has to say about each of these themes. First, regarding the need to put the common good above short-sighted self-interest, Pope Francis declares that we are all in one boat. We can all get sick, rich and poor alike. We are all anxious. We are all vulnerable. We find ourselves afraid and lost, he says. Like the disciples in the gospel, we were caught off guard by an unexpected, turbulent storm. We have realized that we are on the same boat, all of us fragile and disoriented, but at the same time important and needed, all of us called to row together, each of us in need of comforting the other. On this boat are all of us. Further, he stresses, this is not a time for self-centeredness because the challenge we are facing is shared by all without distinguishing between persons. It's one and the same boat, but different decks. Second, we must combat indifference, inv invisibility and individualism. While COVID is a disaster, Pope Francis warns, the risk is that we may then be struck by an even worse virus, that of selfish indifference. A virus spread by the thought that life is better if it is better for me, and that everything will be fine if it is fine for me. It begins there and ends up selecting one person over another, discarding the poor, and sacrificing those left behind on the altar of progress. For with indifference, things that do not affect me do not interest me. Besides being a disease to be fought, the coron coronavirus has shed light on broader social ills. Francis draws out this theme. At times we look at others as objects to be used and discarded. In reality, this type of perspective blinds and fosters an individualistic and aggressive throwaway culture, which transforms the human being into a consumer good. It renders our fellow humans invisible as people. The Holy Father connects these attitudes. Indifferent, I look the other way. Individualist, looking out only for one's own interest. This is not a time for indifference and individualism, he emphasizes over and over again, because the whole world is suffering and needs to be united in facing the pandemic. Thirdly, the Pope warns against forgetfulness regarding present reality as well as the past. About the present, he says clearly, the crisis we are facing should not make us forget the many other crises that bring suffering to so many people. And for us gathered here at Notre Dame, virtually, this includes the crisis of refugees forced across borders and oceans, people displaced internally, and the scourge of human trafficking. The second dimension relates to time. Let us not lose our memory once all this is past, says Pope Francis. Let us not file it away and go back to where we were. Remember that where we were was not good enough. Let us strive for something better that enhances the common good and reduces invisibility, indifference, individualism, and the throwaway culture. The fourth point is to avoid division, especially division that results in violence and bloodshed. This is not a time for division, the Holy Father says. Rather, 
May Christ, our peace, enlighten all who have responsibility in conflicts, that they may have the courage to support the appeal for an immediate global ceasefire in all corners of the world. This is not a time for continuing to manufacture and deal in arms, spending vast amounts of money that ought to be used to care for others and save lives. The fifth and related point is to avoid hypocrisy. This crisis is affecting us all, rich and poor alike, he says, and putting a spotlight on hypocrisy. He goes on, I am worried by the hypocrisy of certain political personalities who speak of facing up to the crisis, of the problem of hunger in the world, but who, in the meantime, manufacture weapons. This is a time to be converted from this kind of functional hypocrisy. It is a time for integrity. Either we are coherent with our beliefs or we lose everything. Sixth, let us vigorously question an economic model based on greed, zeal for profit, and instant gratification. These fault lines were exposed by COVID. Pope Francis notes that greedy for profit, we let ourselves get caught up in things and lured away by haste. We were not shaken awake by wars or injustice across the planet, nor did we listen to the cry of the poor or of our ailing planet. We carried on regardless thinking we would stay healthy in a world that was sick. This is no longer tenable. We need a new paradigm. The Holy Father expresses his hope that this time of danger will free us from operating on automatic pilot, shake our sleepy consciences and allow a humanist and ecological conversion that puts an end to the idolatry of money and places human life and dignity at the center. Our civilization, so competitive, so individualistic, with its frenetic rhythms of production and consumption, its extravagant luxuries, its disproportionate profits for just a few, this so called civilization needs to downshift, take stock, and renew itself. And then the seventh and final point, we cannot rely on a technocratic paradigm. Yes, we do need science-based solutions to the pandemic, well-designed vaccines and therapies. These remedies cannot become the preserve of the rich but must be available to the poor at low or even zero cost. But more fundamentally, the cold anonymity of technocracy will not save us. We must put people first. Pope Francis expresses his hope that governments understand that technocratic paradigms, whether state-centered or market-driven, are not enough to address this crisis or the other great problems affecting humankind. Now, more than ever, persons, communities, and peoples must be put at the center, united to heal, to care, and to share. With these seven topics, let me sum up the deeper paradox. The pandemic appeared in a particular context, one of widespread injustice, inequality, and assaults on our common home. And this context both aggravates the pandemic and impels us to try and make things better. We need to find a cure, both for this small but terrible virus, COVID-19, and for the larger virus of social injustice, inequality of opportunity, marginalization, and the lack of protection for the weakest. 
the prescription offered by Pope Francis unleashes the antibodies of justice, charity, and solidarity. How might we develop such healthy antibodies? Pope Francis spent two months discussing the antibodies, the antidotes, the building blocks of a post-COVID world. In nine Wednesday general audiences in August and September, the Holy Father applied the principles of Catholic social teaching, human dignity, the common good, solidarity, subsidiarity, the universal destination of goods, the preferential option for the poor, and care for our common home, applied these principles of Catholic social teaching to the current pandemic-induced challenges. This, in fact, is the work of every annual Catholic immigrant integration initiative. This is the basic theme of every Father Lidio F. Tomasi annual lecture. In conclusion, dear friends, I began with something of a paradox. Refugees and involuntary migrants are forced to move, to escape, to flee by war, by injustice, by climate change. And yet now they are also forced to stay put, locked down by the COVID pandemic. It is in this paradox between mobile vulnerability and vulnerable lockdown that we reflect on the plight of God's people forced to flee. For we might be in the same boat but we do not suffer equally. The pandemic has put us all in crisis, Pope Francis keeps stressing. But let us remember that after a crisis, a person is not the same. We come out of it better or we come out of it worse. This is our option. We need a vaccine but we also need the good antibodies of solidarity. Let me conclude with a moment on action and conversion. The Holy Father urges us all to exit our self-centered preoccupations and notice others and deal with their pain, not with impersonal charity from on high, but getting our hands and feet dirty Indeed, getting our eyes and ears and hearts dirty. On the periphery, where the vulnerable have been shoved, on the front lines and in the Pope's field hospitals. To see the poor means to restore their humanity, says the Holy Father. They are not things, not garbage, they are people. We cannot settle for a welfare policy such as we have for rescued animals. And he pushes us deeper. Go down into the underground and pass from the hyper-virtual, fleshless world to the suffering flesh of the poor. This is the conversion we have to undergo. undergo. And if we don't start there, there will be no conversion. The new normal, the new normal to which we are called is indeed that of the kingdom of God, where the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. Thank you very much. God bless you. And God bless all our conversation and all the moments of this conference. Thank you. Thank you, Cardinal Cherney, for that inspiring, timely lecture on forcibly displaced, many of whom are now paradoxically locked down. And on Pope Francis's message that the pandemic 
creates the occasion for all of us to commit to a more just and equitable world and to deal with what you called the larger virus. We're now pleased to be able to call on two of the Catholic Church's leading scholars and thinkers on migration issues who will respond to His Eminence's talk. They are Kristen Heyer, Professor of Theology at Boston College and Director of Graduate Studies for the Theology Department. Kristen is a prolific author and editor. I'd like to particularly commend her book, Kinship Across Borders of Christian Ethic Immigration. And Father Daniel Grudy, who's an associate provost at Notre Dame and an associate professor of theology. Father Daniel has written and edited numerous books and produced several films. One of his edited volumes based on an earlier conference at Notre Dame is entitled A Promised Land, Perilous Journey, theological perspectives on migration. After Kristen's and Father Daniel's comments, Father Dowd will moderate a discussion with Cardinal Cherney and our respondents drawing questions from the audience. Kristen? Thanks, Don. Thanks for today's invitation and the work of your partners at the Center for Migration Studies and the University of Notre Dame. Uh, and thank you, Cardinal Cherney, uh, for these insightful diagnoses and your summons to conversion in these times of mobility and lockdown. Your reflections on shared vulnerability offer hope that a renewed recognition of this interconnectedness can inoculate against idolatries that impede solidarity with the displaced. Your focus on the roles of selfish indifference and forgetfulness highlight how these prevailing attitudes fuel harmful migration policies and lethal inaction. In the US context, the pandemic has served as a vehicle for the administration to accelerate restrictionist measures, effectively ending asylum at the southern border. Observers have described the pandemic as a tragedy and a teacher, as it has both revealed and exacerbated inequalities and patterns of exploitation. As the US bishops recently testified, 74% of undocumented workers and 78% of black refugees are essential workers facing increased precarity particularly those serving our communities through their labor in food supply chains. So we are called to meet the needs of these endangered migrant workers, as well as to leverage this visibility into sustained concern. New forms of resistance to forgetfulness emerged this summer. As symbols of colonial empire were toppled, and movements for Black liberation targeted Confederate monuments, global attention was focused on enduring sins of the past. The attendant protests and discourse underscored tensions between some nations' restrictionist policies and law and order rhetoric on the one hand, and own checkered histories of respect for other nations' borders on the other. This indicates promise for a much needed shift in migration discussions from individualistic paradigms of crisis management to longstanding responsibilities in justice. Beyond evoking the sea of indifference and the fog of amnesia, you lament the frenetic rhythms of consumption and production fairly slowed for those privileged enough to work from home on lockdown, even as we add homeschooling to the intensified pace. We have heard throughout this papacy how challenging economic inequalities must extend beyond meeting needs and crafting policies to healing social sin. Beyond economic idolatry, the pandemic has served to upend illusory idols of control, self-sufficiency, and invulnerability, all of which similarly serve to strengthen exclusionary dynamics. 
in that vein, you identify other larger viruses at play, those of social injustice and marginalization. Particular strains of those viruses, uh, such as gender bias, xenophobia, and racism, further threaten the dignity and safety of our displaced brothers and sisters. Your charge to develop antibodies of justice and charity is fitting then, given the infectious forces that serve to exclude, exploit, and isolate. How might our Catholic commitments and communities seize this opportunity to reshape our moral imagination? How might our biblical narratives, liturgical practices, and engagement with the arts interrupt self-interested and fearful tendencies. Cultivating empathetic antidotes will require us to draw near to the realities of immigrant communities marked by vitality and vulnerability alike. Uh, the work of your migrants and refugees section and the example of Pope Francis attune us to these incarnational and affective dimensions of conversion, counteracting anesthetized indifference with the fruits of accompaniment and the gifts of tears. Finally, developing antibodies requires practices of exculturation, reforming inhumane or patronizing practices in receiving communities in order to foster integration. May our pandemic experiences of shared yet differential vulnerability convert us to gospel hospitality and to sustained solidarity with those on the move. Thank you for your ongoing work to lead us on that journey. Thank you, Kristen, and thank you, Cardinal Cherney, for those beautiful words. And thank you, Cardinal Cherney, for your continued witness and commitment to advancing this, uh, this work on behalf of migrants and refugees and continuing to be a voice for Pope Francis's prophetic words today. You know, your, your talk really uh, on COVID, the virus of COVID, and really the virus of selfishness really brought to mind the words of C.S. Lewis, who said that really our task in life is to become another Christ. And that by becoming another, another Christ, what we're really called to do is to be part of a good infection and to really be part of infecting the world with the goodness of God and to really let the reign of God continue to work in the world like leaven. So I think this good infection uh, of the gospel and good infection that Pope Francis uh, and Cardinal Cherney are really uh, bringing out is just so important in our world where we feel so much darkness and so much pain and, and really so much distress. I too would like to just say a couple words about these antibodies of justice and charity and solidarity and to really uh, uh, ask uh, how can we continue to develop these antibodies and especially as Pope Francis situates the mission of the church as a field hospital. And it's particularly fitting, I think, as we really deepen what that field hospital means in this time of so many global ills. One of the things to me that's always struck me about uh, the words of Cardinal Cherney and the words of Pope Francis uh, really uh, have to do with one of Pope Francis's first pastoral visits when he was elected. And shortly after he was elected, he heard a story about a group of refugees who had left the African coast and they were traveling uh, to look for more dignified lives and they were crossing the Mediterranean. And in the context of their journey across the Mediterranean, these boats can have seven or 800 people on them. Their boat capsized and only eight people survived, but they survived by clinging to a fishing net in the middle of the ocean. And when the fishermen saw them clinging to those nets, instead of saving them, they actually severed their nets and cast them to die in the ocean depths. And Pope Francis was so moved by this globalization of indifference that within eight days, he went down to this small island of Lampedusa, which is only about eight square miles. And he remembered these migrants that died who the world had become indifferent to. And he celebrated mass on an ocean harbor in Lampedusa. And he used uh, an altar that was made from the driftwood of a refugee boat. 
and he he had a a crozier f that was actually in the form of a wave and he actually used a chalice that was made as well from the driftwood of this refugee boat and it's really raised the question um how was his visit to lampedusa a microcosm of the vision of mission for the church for pope francis and how is it a, a really a call to move to the periphery and how is it a chance to really go to those to whom the world had become indifferent to but also to speak of a globalization of solidarity. So I would just like to offer just a few words on the Eucharist and uh, refugees, and especially as we look about uh, really this voyage of people who are considered nobodies in the world today, uh, their struggle to become somebody, uh, their connection to everybody, but ultimately their connection to the body of Christ. And so I'd just like to just highlight three parts of that uh, and really look at it in the context of really what is in effect a passing over. As we know, the Mass is built on the Passover ritual, but it also, as Cardinal Journey has said, it's about a conversion that calls us to pass, it, pass over to a different way of thinking. The first is passing over from migrant to person. Uh, I think that many migrants feel such a distress of being labeled only in political terms, but not on human terms. And I think one of the things that they've often said uh, to me when I've asked them, what's the most difficult they say it's often being treated like you're a dog, like you're the lowest form of life on earth and like you're no one to anyone. So how is this virus of indifference reflect itself in this dehumanization? And how can the church continue to witness to the humanity of the migrant and defining the migrant first and foremost as made in the image and likeness of God? Secondly, as Cardinal Cherney mentioned that this is really a problem about our relationships and that really there is a call to pass over from injustice to justice. And in this sense, justice is not just about protesting, but justice ultimately from a biblical perspective is about getting our relationships right. And if our relationships are not right, we're not gonna be right. And if migrants suffer, everybody suffers. And how do we see ourselves part of this interwoven web together uh, where, uh, where one suffers, all suffer. Thirdly, I think uh, also very, very important is passing over from a sense of nationalism to the reign of God. Uh, I think uh, the definition of, of nation states uh, as really kind of limiting and circumscribing the borders of our charity and not looking at, as Cardinal Cherney said, the, the international common good and our connectedness across borders. And Kristen, your great work on kinship across borders, trying to really foster those bonds of union uh, that really at the heart of who we are. So in the end, I think the Eucharist, Pope Francis's uh, Mass in Lampedusa, uh, really call us in the end to move from otherness to oneness. That's really, the, the, I think, the task, and really the fundamental task of life. I mean, in the end of the day, if we're called to communion, literally, that um, if we are really to uh, find this journey home, uh, we're called to move um, really towards this oneness and away from this otherness, which so defines the migration debate. debate. Lydia Tomasi, I want to end on this. Uh, Lydia Tomasi really uh, had uh, some powerful words when he finished up his doctoral dissertation. Uh, he said, you know, in the end of the day, um, it's not that the church saves the immigrant, but when you see that the immigrant's capacity to believe in the midst of the unbelievable, to have faith in the midst of most godless contexts, and to love even in the midst of such hatred, that it's not that the church saves the immigrant, it's the immigrant who saves the church. And so I think the Eucharist really breaks down this divide between us and them. Uh, and really in the end of the day, this, this conference and our mission is about God's migration to us, our return migration to God, and our call to accompany the migrant in ways that welcome, protect, promote, and integrate, as Pope Francis says. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you, Dan. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, really appreciate it. And thank you, Cardinal. We have some time for, for questions and for a bit of a discussion. Um, so I'd welcome people to use the Q&A feature to submit any questions that you have for the Cardinal, for Dan, and for Kristen. Um, but let me get us started just by, by asking this question. We often hear talk about the need for a new normal. And Cardinal, you, you talked a bit about this, quite a bit about it. 
the need for a new normal, not back to the old normal, which wasn't so great. Um, the question is, you know, what does this new normal look like? And how can the church effectively promote this kind of new normal that's so needed coming out of the pandemic? And I, I really, I really uh, sort of um, ask that question of, of all three of you. Well, I'm, I'm ready to take a, take a crack at it. Um, for me, one of the best um, um, articulations, expressions of uh, what we uh, say is the new normal, and it's not something new that we're saying, but the normal is always new, and that's the, the very principles of Catholic social teaching uh, that I actually listed uh, in my talk, and uh, which I think many of us know uh, quite by heart, uh, beginning with uh, the human dignity and the common good, and including uh, uh, solidarity and uh, the preferential option for the poor. Uh, th those are uh, new normals. They're, those are the new normal, I would say, because they are not just um, ideals. Um, let's say, um, compared with a word like love, or, or even a word like justice, uh, the, the principles of Catholic social teaching are, are more uh, enfleshed. They are more uh, normative. Uh, they actually um, help you to recognize not only what you want, what, what would be the goal, what would be the ideal, but also um, useful applicable measures of how far away you are from the goal. And so um, that would be one uh, proposed answer to your question. Uh, are you willing to consider the new normal? Consider the basic principles of Catholic social teaching. I'd add to that just the yeah. call to a deep in contemplation uh, about who we are in the world. Uh, Rowan Williams, the Anglican Archbishop, gave a retreat to uh, the Curia a number of years ago, and he had a very powerful uh, statement where he said that really the key to getting to this new normal uh, is really through contemplation. And, and unless we're really allowing our minds and hearts to be changed and transformed, uh, we're going to inhabit these chaotic and unexamined emotions. And really our acquisitive system that's constantly asking us to buy and to have more and all of which is making us frenetic and crazy. So we really look at the world, if you will, in the current normal, like through a circus mirror. So how can contemplation give us a way of rewiring and refocusing our lives to see ourselves and others in a different way? Just to add to that, I'm um, reminded of uh, Pope Francis's words after I think both in Manila and closer to here where we are in Juarez, um, when Dan was talking about how moved he was to go to Lampedusa, um, I think this sense of letting our hearts be touched, Pope Francis said, only eyes cleansed by tears can see clearly. I wonder if um, these experiences of pandemic that Cardinal Cherney has highlighted um, can help us certainly to continue to go to the peripheries, but, but maybe even to just go around the corner or see within our own communities with fresh eyes, just how tied up our own practices are to the well-being of migrants in our midst. So I wonder if the new um, visibility of essential workers who remain so precarious um, could help families to better understand how their own eating practices or spending practices um, outreach practices directly implicate those, all of us on, on a boat together, as you say. So I wonder if the new normal could include through contemplation a bit more attentiveness um, to this interconnected web um, and our own everyday actions in solidarity with those on the move. Thank you, thank you, Kristen. Um, this virus of indifference, um, how do we, how do we 
address this virus? How can we, what, what is the vaccine to that virus? What does that look like? Um, we know that it's, uh, it's been a problem for, for a long time. And, uh, and so how do we, how do we inoculate? Is there, is there such a thing as an inoculation or a vaccine against this indifference? What is, and what does that look like? Cardinal Cherney. Um, uh, vaccine is perhaps um, is a bit too strong in the sense that it, you, you, you get your vaccine once and then uh, you're actually free to forget about uh, that particular disease or that particular threat. And uh, I think that um, the virus of indifference is more like sin. And so uh, there isn't a one shot solution. It's more uh, the uh, process and the pilgrimage of life uh, it includes uh, the mysteries of the Eucharist uh, that uh, we heard about and the, also the Passover of, uh, con of penitence, of penance and of confession, um, of uh, failing to be uh, attentive and uh, putting that into God's hands and asking for his mercy and recognizing that I'm not the one who's going to save myself from indifference any more than I save myself from uh, other sins. Uh, so there is, there is uh, we, we're maybe uh, closer to the uh, mystery of evil, the mystery of sin, um, thanks in part to the shock of, uh, of the pandemic these last uh, six or seven months, but also because as, uh, as Kristen said, the pandemic, uh, uh, not only exacerbated, but also highlighted, focused on the chronic ongoing injustices on which our welfare, uh, our well-being, our lifestyle uh, seem to be based. And uh, so I think uh, there isn't an, an answer to your question. It's more like how do I respond and we respond on, you might say on the small scale to God's call that comes to us through those who need us. And if I might make a uh, little plug, uh, introduce a plug here that on Sunday, uh, the Holy Father is going to give us his new encyclical, uh, Fratelli Tutti. And uh, here I think he will be uh, inviting us to go uh, deeper and further along the very lines that we're talking about right now. I think, too, what uh, threatens us is not just the virus. I think we have a more fundamental uh, heart problem going on. And I know that a uh, number of years ago when I was little, I, I encountered a pamphlet that really struck me. And it, it said, did you know that you could actually miss heaven by 18 inches? And I was very intrigued as an eight-year-old to pick this up. And as I went on to read it, it said that the distance between the head and the heart in most people is only 18 inches. And that God wasn't something just to understand in the depths of our, our, our minds, but also to encounter in the depths of our hearts. And I think this migration to the heart is probably one of the more challenging migrations. And I think one of the more difficult ones. And arguably, the walls that we build between our minds and our hearts are really one of the things that create the current situation that we have. So how do we actually do this migration from the head to the heart and back to the head again? or even from the migration to the head, to the heart, and to the feet, and back again. Uh, I think that's really the more fundamental issue about this. And as Pope Francis said, the outer deserts of the world are increasing because the inner deserts of the world are increasing. And in many ways, our lack of ability to do the inner migration as well is manifesting itself in some of these globalized differences that we're talking about. I really agree. I think... Um... I'm struck more and more uh, by people who um, are unmoved by uh, statistics about immigrants' impact or even the church's best human rights arguments. Um, and I think for me that um, necessitates traveling from the head to the heart as, as uh, Father Daniel pointing out this sense that those arguments are so important not to abandon, but on their own, they're not always calling folks 
to repentance or, or um, interrupting this apathy or this indifference. Um, and so I think the more we can um, access through encounter and incarnational practices, even under lockdown, we may have to mediate that like we are today in different ways. Um, and the more we can um, use these practices, practices of liturgy, uh, even practices of the art to get more at the heart, get more at capturing and shifting the moral imagination, breaking open, um, popping these soap bubbles of indifference. Um, I think church communities are well poised to do so. I was struck at a, an immigration conference last year uh, down at Columbia Seminary. There were many uh, panels, uh, there were plenaries and responses, but they also integrated um, a really transformative uh, liturgy that began the conference. They incorporated a plenary from a poet laureate. They incorporated um, murals made from sewn together vests of, of capsized ships in the Mediterranean uh, and a modern dance um, performance about refugees. And I, it just made me think that we have to begin to um, counter indifference by accessing, as you say, uh, both the heart and the head. Great. Well, thank you. We do have some questions coming in from our conference participants. Um, here's one. Uh, the, the indifference of people in power seems to be a, a special challenge, especially in the United States. Uh, so what can church leadership do to stimulate a process of conversion of political leaders so that they take to heart very deeply the seven key themes that, that Cardinal Cherney highlighted. Um, well, I think uh, on the one hand, it's, it's remarkable that, uh, for example, in, in the United States over the past uh, uh, five years, seven years since uh, Pope Francis uh, began, uh, since he went to Lampedusa, the bishops of the United States have been uh, very, uh, clear, very focused, very, uh, very repetitive, and uh, very persuasive on these issues. So on the one hand, I think that part of what our church response uh, should be and is uh, to what you describe is to speak up and to speak clearly and not to get discouraged uh, by uh, being rebuffed or ignored and just to keep speaking. So that's on the one hand. On the other hand, um, I think we need to open a, a kind of a new dimension of our uh, reflection, our pastoral preparation, and maybe even uh, our uh, uh, academic research, certainly our policy. And that, has, that is to, to take seriously the fears of the people who are freaked out by the migrant, migrants and by the refugees and by the whole prospect of new people coming. Uh, that's part of what it means to be human too. We're, we're not all immediately enthusiastic about the new or about change or about newcomers. And um, I think maybe we've uh, uh, in some ways insisted uh, rightly, but on the other hand, what about the reluctance? What about the, the cold feet? What about the inarticulate fears which make it so difficult to take that first step, which then does uh, get, us, um, get us involved, uh, heart and mind and soul and hands and feet and all that. So that would be my second thing. One is let, let the church continue to speak and to uh, advocate so, uh, so clearly and so prophetically. And at the same time, let's uh, give some pastoral attention to the, the, the reluctance, the fear, the hesitation, the misgivings, uh, which, uh, which are also part of uh, the human experience and, and certainly part of what our people, both within the Catholic Church and, and more broadly, are also uh, certainly going through. I think what is impressive as well is, is the different ways the church engages this issue and, you know, uh, whether it be direct service, whether it be education, whether it be uh, uh, political advocacy, or whether it be research. I think there's ways in which I think that many people on this call work together in different ways and focus in different aspects to try to work at this. 
But I think in, in this question more specifically, what can the church do to facilitate conversion? I think one of the most important is to create spaces where people can be in relationship with those who are on the move. And I think that's one of the hardest parts. People ask, what would you say to politicians today about this issue if you could? And I'd say, go to a migrant camp, go to the border, uh, listen to the stories of the people, feel their pain. And if that doesn't move us, then we've got bigger issues in our country than immigration. I think that's really the biggest thing. And again, that gets back to this more fundamental migration into our humanity and into the human heart. Yeah, I would echo that. I, I think um, the church in both its uh, legislative advocacy, but also in its um, preaching uh, ministries has a really important opportunity to counter what uh, Father Dan was mentioning, this kind of pervasive dehumanization of the migrant and, and to counter um, myths and misconceptions that are um, too often the sound bites that we hear, kind of reductive discourse about security threats or about economic threats, um, thinly veiled uh, cultural threats. Um, and yet on the other hand, I really agree, Cardinal Cherney, that we cannot simply bypass the legitimate fears and misgivings and misunderstandings um, of those who feel that there's a tension between uh, welcoming newcomers um, and protecting their own well-being. So I do think churches are in a unique position um, ministering as we do to people across economic spectrum, political spectrum, um, to create spaces, as Father Dan just said, not only um, to be in relationship with people on the move, um, but maybe to have open and honest conversations uh, with people about um, their own family history, their own genealogy, and maybe how that has shaped um, their outlook on migration, their own um, economic concerns, their own uh, fears. I think um, that would go a long way. That's become an endangered species, I fear, uh, too often. So, so opportunities to bring people together to have open conversations towards some common ground. Um, I think would filter up to, to the questioner's concern about political leaders as well. Thank you. I mean, I do think it's really important for us to uh, kind of look around and, and try to uh, learn from each other about the most effective ways to promote the culture of encounter that's really necessary, I think, to uh, somehow counter the, um, the indifference that we find or the lack of understanding that we find in communities uh, across uh, the world, really, and uh, particularly in the United States these days. Um, nationalism, um, you know, Father Dan raised uh, the, the challenge that uh, nationalism presents. And um, what can we do um, to, to sort of, uh, mitigate the forces that lead to a narrow kind of nationalism, an ethnic-based nationalism, which seems to, to be behind um, really um, uh, sort of forces that, um, that prevent us from being more welcoming. I mean, I guess the first question would be, what, what, what explains why people define their nation in, in narrow ethnic terms? Um, and what can we do and what can the church do to, to change that? Yeah. Uh, well, I think, I think maybe we should start the other way around and say that um, what, was, uh, what was absolutely normal and uh, self-understood was to define yourself exactly as you've said. So that, that's, that was the starting point. And um, the different forms of tribalism uh, over over the centuries were important parts of uh, of human survival. If if we hadn't banded together at, on our own terms and did everything el everything possible to fight off and compete with uh, the the others, our group wouldn't have survived. So I think we we should accept uh, the fact that that the group instinct, the herd instinct, the um, 
the uh, in that sense the ethnocentric uh, those are all part of of human evolution but maybe we could uh, take a leaf out of uh, uh, child psychology and human development and say, yes, we, there are phases and then you grow out of those phases and you don't, uh, you don't, uh, the, the fact that you have tantrums when you're three doesn't mean that you need to have tantrums when you're 30. So uh, I think we've come along and maybe what happened since World War II is that we thought it was, um, we were tricked into thinking that this was going, this was happening uh, by itself and that we were becoming a world uh, community, uh, a world human family. And with the fall of the wall at the end of the last century, we thought, well, that was the last obstacle. And now we're in for a marvelous century of uh, humanity and harmony and uh, uh, all those good things. And now when uh, the model, which has uh, now become practically uh, the only model that we have for running our economies and dependent on that for, uh, I would say, mismanaging our countries. Uh, now we see that uh, that doesn't work and that, uh, and so it's, it's easy to fall back on um, out of date instincts and uh, uh, obsolete uh, forms of self defense or self protection or self promotion. That would, that would be my reading of, of the situation. We've been uh, shocked by, first by the crisis of 2008, which went uh, completely, uh, I mean, which is a, a, a world-class example of impunity. And, that, and now this, and um, I can, in some, from that point of view, you can say, well, the, the, this group, uh, the international approach, the global approach, the harmonious approach is, uh, is not working. I don't think it's true. I think it's. Uh, I think it's the the mistake is in the is more in the economic model than in the than in the uh, ideal of uh, of uh, human cooperation, of multilateralism, of collaboration, and of of transcending uh, these categories. But uh, the shock has uh, caused the uh, superficial harmony to um, prove its brittleness. And so here we are faced with the real problems. And the real problems are how we treat one another and how we treat the planet. It's where we're at. And it's tough because the decisions that we need now are not the popular ones, as I think we all know. I think the issues, uh, as you mentioned, about, uh, of identity go through this issue across the world, that identity politics are inevitable and identity formation is inevitable. So I think the question is, uh, how do uh, we see the positive value of forming an identity in terms of our nation state, but how do we also have a capacity to go beyond those identities? I know when I watch the Olympics uh, during the Summer Olympics, I'm always looking to see that uh, we've actually won more medals than China. Uh, in the summer and in the winter that we've won more medals in Russia. Uh, and I often take some pride in my national identity until I see the Russian skater go like this. And then I realize that there's something in that person that transcends my particular national identity that unites me with that person on the ice. And so I think really uh, what's at stake here is uh, how our identities grow and evolve. And underneath the identities, what's our operative narrative? And, um, and I think, uh, how do we grow and transform those narratives so they become more inclusive and they become more just, they become more humane, that they see our interconnectedness. And right now there's so many narratives that are going against that current. So that to me is the issue is not that we have an identity or not, not that we even have a national identity or not, but how do those identities kind of yield to a deeper identity of who we are before God, who we are uh, in ourselves and who we are to each other. I would just add that I think here in the United States in recent decades, you also have a number of factors um, hardening those nationalisms that you raise or helping explain the preference for an ethno uh, cultural nationalism over a more civic nationalism. Um, I think after uh, September 11th, you had a, a move to conflate immigration with terrorism um, that, that 
furthered a certain narrative. I think if you look in the history of this country, um, often kind of anti-immigrant sentiment has coincided with times of economic downturn. So that can become an easy uh, kind of scapegoating narrative that hardens um, ethnocentric loyalties. Um, and I think also in this country, you've seen in, in recent decades, um, kind of anxiety about demographic shifts in the country, kind of um, feeding a reversion to this kind of um, nationalism that you mentioned. And I wonder too, if increasingly um, the way we access our news and um, the function of social media only kind of further um, hardens those differences rather than invites us to these new broader narratives. So I would just agree that there are a lot of forces working in that direction um, and now more rhetoric uh, about the kind of pitting globalism and the decisions Cardinal Cherney rightly says we need to be making against nationalism, um, but that we really need uh, new narratives um, that would foster a civic nationalism, a way in which we define what it means to be a member of our community, not primarily over and against an outsider, an outside threat, um, the other as different, um, but based on the ideas that we share. Um, and I think, I think that's really a, a vacuum or a lacuna right now that makes the field ripe for these more dangerous forms of, of nationalism. Mm -hmm. A few more questions from our conference participants. Here's one. How can we think about the, and address the cruel paradox of some Im immigrants risking their lives as essential workers and others refusing to wear masks as an expression of their freedom uh, while the very poor cannot socially distance or even afford masks? Um, just so that out to anyone who might want to address that question. I think that, I mean, I, to me, these discussions of freedom are just absurd. I, I, this, the fact that freedom isn't to do whatever I want. Freedom is to really have the capacity to choose the good. And if I'm not free to think about my neighbor, then in some sense, uh, freedom is compromised. So as we know, it's not freedom just to do what I want, but it's freedom from something and freedom for something. Freedom from my own agendas, freedom from my own selfishness, freedom from my own kind of individualism and seeing a freedom for, you know, uh, the other and, and for the common good. So I, I think these questions of freedom are, are really critical to discuss. And unfortunately, a lot of the bantering about freedom has nothing to do with really an adequate understanding of it. I think this is a place the Catholic Church has a, a significant contribution to make. I agree with Father Dan in this sense that at least in, in this culture here in the United States, a negative understanding of freedom, a pretty impoverished understanding of freedom as immunity from coercion, uh, immunity from intrusion, uh, to pursue my personal good is dominant. And so to be able to show, as Cardinal Journey was concluding his, his plenary, that these building blocks of Catholic social teaching give us a far more robust and expansive understanding of freedom. So freedom uh, that more akin to the UN declaration encompasses social, economic, and cultural rights um, really means that we're free for participation in the life of the community so that freedom uh, and considerations of the common good like public health are not opposed, but are really intrinsically related. Um, so I, I agree that becomes countercultural and we see some of the consequences. And so there's a real opportunity there, I think, for Catholic social teaching to, to leaven and um, interrupt that discourse. Um, maybe I'd add another, another factor that we've touched on a little bit, which is uh, what, does, uh, what does freedom mean as defined by our experience of social media? And uh, over the past relatively few years, we have this, uh, new opportunity in which there's a kind of uh, consequence-free uh, opportunity or option just to say what I, whatever, whatever passes through my mind and to uh, support or to oppose without any consequences, any responsibility. So I think that, that we're, we're, we're in the midst of a, a, a cultural and maybe even moral revolution um, 
provoked or enabled by uh, social by the cell phone that uh, gives us a, uh, a a very distorted notion of freedom and when that uh, kind of freedom uh, gets acted out in, in uh, real time and in real space it obviously has very serious uh, consequences which don't show up on on the cell phone itself although there there's also a great deal of injustice and, and damage done. So I think uh, here's another piece of uh, another uh, agenda item for the church's uh, research, uh, reflection and pastoral creativity, which is to help our people to be good Christians also when they're um, on the cell phone and to learn uh, how to live our vocation, our human and Christian vocation also in this context. Uh, so that uh, it doesn't distort our sense of what it means to be free or what it means to be myself or what it means to be connected with other people. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. And here's, a, here's another question uh, specifically for you, Cardinal. Um, first of all, uh, thanks for your wonderful and inspiring lecture. You spoke repeatedly about solidarity. Everything starts in-house. How do we hold bishops, clergy, and lay pastoral leaders accountable to solidarity? Uh, many unfortunately downplay conversations about migrants and refugees, stop efforts to discuss these issues publicly, and more gravely remain silent in their homilies and teachings about injustices toward immigrants, or fail to become more vocal uh, about what uh, the church teaches. Well, that's for you, Cardinal. <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, the, the, uh, the question uh, is, is full of uh, potential for, uh, for doing good. And I would say that the answer is uh, invite them. Whoever, whoever you were mentioning in the question, uh, invite them to, um, to come along. Um, earlier, we heard the expression, go to the border. I would just change that a little bit and say, come to the border, come to the border, come with me to the, I'm going to the border, would you like to come? I'm going to the soup kitchen, would you like to come? I'm going to the uh, detention center, would you like to come? I think that's very, very fundamental. And uh, actually, uh, today is the feast of the guardian angels. And I think that uh, for me, that's one of the, uh, one of the tangible ways in which we experience angels is when people take us by the hand and help us to cross, help us, as you said, Father, to pass over. It's very hard to pass over without a guardian angel. And so you, you, we, need, we need people to take us by the hand and bring us over to the periphery where we would otherwise not have the courage to go and introduce us and just ease the transition, ease the passage, the passing over, so that we can then uh, that, uh, as, as I said myself, get our, not only our hands and feet, but also our ears, eyes, and heart dirty, uh, which is another word for incarnation. And that's, so that's what we need, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Dan and Kristen, are you interested in addressing that question as well? You know, I, I do think that the bishops do deserve some uh, fairness in the question, Hobson. I know you've actually worked very closely with the bishops as well, but there's some people on this call, Don Kerwin, uh, you know, as well as uh, other people who have worked on this, uh, Bill Keefe as well. Uh, bishops have been working really hard on this issue. And there are people like Mark Seitz down at El Paso. Uh, uh, there are uh, also other people who have really spoken out on this issue. They, the, the, the United States bishops have uh, resettled more uh, refugees than any other country in the world. And if you were to take just the resettlement work of the bishops, uh, it would be the second largest reseller of refugees in the world. So there's a tremendous amount of good work that has been done. And I think that uh, really, uh, unfortunately, they don't publicize a lot of that. But they're working to change laws. They're working for pastoral responses. Um, and more, a lot more can be done. In light of what needs to be done, it seems like nothing is happening. But I think that the church has been consistent and very clear about the work that needs to be done here. And I like what Cardinal Trey said of like inviting bishops into this space, knowing that they too also need to go deeper in this. 
but there are an extraordinary number of bishops uh, uh, that have worked on this and continue to work on this. And I do think it's important to recognize that work. I think sometimes I, I talk to um, seminarians or clergy who are apprehensive about preaching on such a divisive issue, um, which is that it's a divisive issue for any of us who work, who works on this, right? Um, so I think cultivating um, spaces where we can all have the courage to enter into these, um, what are difficult dialogues rather than kind of compartmentalize that in the, in work in Washington or work at the border, um, but to really uh, take risks um, and be charitable with each other so that it's um, less intimidating to broach the topic or even preach on the topic um, amid communities that may um, remain quite different in their perspective. So I think um, I hear that happening more, uh, willingness to, to kind of risk entering into those um, challenging conversations. Um, but I also like these ideas of um, accompanying one another to spaces that, that provoke new perspectives. Mm -hmm. So much of our conversation uh, today has been, um, you know, about receiving countries or destination countries and the need to be uh, welcoming and to, and to accompany and ally with um, immigrants and refugees. But what about uh, immigration countries? What about countries of origin? Um, how can we more effectively address the challenges that actually push people out of their countries? Uh, I think the, the short answer in the, in, in the context of our discussion is to, uh, is to pay attention to the right to remain. Uh, we, we start our discussions about migration once, once people have made the, the difficult decision or once uh, fleeing is inevitable. Uh, and uh, so then all the steps follow and the consequences follow. But the uh, original situation and the original uh, decision deserve a lot more attention. And really, finally, the right to remain is uh, another name for integral human development. In other words, uh, what needs to be done so that a person who migrates makes that choice freely, like many people whom we know, and maybe many of us um, on this call, uh, on this uh, conference, have freely chosen to study or to work or to settle down or to spend five years in a country other than uh, the country of their birth. And uh, uh, that's, that's so normal and so enriching and it's part of what we all talk about uh, with one another and it's, it's, that's life. But the, the, the people who are forced to flee are what we call uh, vulnerable migrants or refugees or uh, displaced people. And they deserve this right, uh, which is the right to remain. So that the choice between remaining or moving is a real choice. It's a 50-50 proposition. And I choose the one or the other because of the advantages or the attractiveness of the one or the other. Now, for us, um, who live in rich countries to assure the right to remain is the whole and entire revolution that's required if we're going to have integral human development. And uh, you're gonna to have to have a dozen conferences for us to explain that. So I won't get into it right now, but just use the, the formula. But integral human development is the, is the uh, quiet but vast revolution that our world needs in order for us to get back to the uh, new normal that I uh, mentioned at the end of my speech, which is uh, living together like brothers and sisters. Just to add to that, I, you know, reiterate as well that the first ideal is to stay in your home country and that migration today is not the problem. Migration is a symptom of deeper problems that cause people to migrate. 
then we think about the 19% of the world lives on less than a dollar a day, that 48% of the world lives on less than $2 a day, that 75% of the world lives on less than $10 a day, and 95% of the world lives on less than $50 a day. I mean, to think about the top, the three richest people in the world have as much as the poorest 48 nations uh, really brings up the fact that, 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 you know, when people don't have enough to eat, they're going to move. And so the solutions to this really are in business and in creating spaces where people can have jobs, as well as in political, uh, stable political structures and judicial systems. A lot of people leaving out of Central America and other places are not just leaving these countries, they're fleeing these countries. And, and I think it's, it's remarkable um, that the insecurity that they face um, is something that also needs to enter the equation. So I think that just the current attorney says the, the ideal is that people have a right to remain and that really what needs to happen is development for people to stay. I would also add that um, I really appreciated, Cardinal Cerna, your emphasis on forgetfulness in your talk. And that, um, for me, raised this question of um, push factors and, and broader responsibility. I think in terms of the right to remain, too often we, um, migration discourse and even migration policy, um, ignores what Father Dan just said, that this is symptomatic, not the problem, and kind of focuses in the present as a, a crisis to manage, rather than taking a longer view um, to consider broader patterns that have built bridges from sending to receiving countries or um, interventions, economic policies, trade policies that have generated un unwilling migrants, um, foreign policy interventions, um, or colonial histories, um, I, I really think a sense of uh, working against that amnesia um, or presentism could help reframe um, concerns about these sending countries, certainly in terms of promoting integral human development, um, but even beyond a, a moral model of um, crisis management or focusing on the individual border crosser or even charity and aid um, to questions of justice um, that, that take those histories and receiving countries' complicity in generating refugees and migrants more seriously. Great. Um, so two of you are professors, uh, Dan and Kristen and, uh, and Cardinal, I know you've been a professor. And uh, what role might you know, Catholic colleges and universities play in all of this? You know, particularly in the United States, we have quite a few of them. And, um, and you know, Notre Dame's a co-sponsor of, uh, of this conference. Um, what more could Catholic colleges and universities play in kind of promoting the kind of um, revolution that you're calling for, Cardinal Cherney? Um, how, what, what more could colleges and universities do to kind of uh, promote the realization of the new normal that we so desperately need? Well, I, I, I think in, in the short run, uh, a kind of immediate, um, immediate role measure would be uh, to um, dramatically increase, let me say just double, uh, the number of um, uh, migrants and or uh, migrant offspring uh, that are encouraged or assisted to enroll in in our universities. I think that if uh, the the proportion, uh, if it if it also became normal that if you go to a Catholic school, you're going to be with uh, twenty or thirty percent of um, first generation or recently arrived people who are. Uh, who are themselves uh, struggling to find their place in this new country, and you're you're part of that. Uh, I I believe that can only be a, a great help. So, without going into large uh, theories about uh, education and educational theory and education and transformation, uh, maybe it's a dumb idea, but I would just say double double your intake and. Uh, and the, the, the migrants will do the rest of it. 
remember a couple years ago of being at the Syrian Turkish border and a group of refugees were there that just fled over and they were all of high school age. And I said, if you could give one speech to the United Nations, what would you say? And I remember this one girl said, to get an education. That's what I most want is to get an education. And so I think, as Cardinal Turney said, one thing is to try to open up spaces. And as, as uh, you mentioned, Bob, in the beginning, that uh, there's a lot of Catholic colleges and universities that have recognized that they have a moral responsibility and duty to bring people who are migrants and refugees uh, into spaces of ongoing learning. So I think there is a, a space to be more welcoming of them. But it's also to teach people about this issue. There's so many operative narratives about this issue that what's at stake today is the narrative about migration. And, and as Christy would know so well, the ethics that flow from that narrative. So the, the competing narratives today uh, around migration today really need to be challenged and transformed. And I think we need to have narratives that are imbued with Catholic values and a vision of Catholic life and faith that makes us more human. So I think those are also important. The other is to create spaces to convene people. I, I think one of the things that universities can do more easily than other places is to bring people together and knowing that the university does one thing, but people working on the ground floor do another thing. The Bishop's Conference does another thing. People who are doing political advocacy does other, do other things. So how can we create spaces where people can come together uh, and ultimately uh, add to the networks and enhance the networks and really strengthen the networks so that recognizing that what the university does is one piece of the puzzle, but we need to really work in concert with other people doing important work in this area. Yeah, I would really echo all of those ideas. Um, I do think creating space for actual migrant and refugee and first gen or DACA as um, Father Bob was saying, students at our universities um, is a significant step. I think that, um, Sometimes those conversations are not uncontroversial and, and a zero sum game or um, scarcity model can arise. And so I think pushing for that so that we're um, embodying what we advocate would go a long way in terms of the integrity you mentioned in your, in your keynote. Um, and I think in addition to Father Dan's suggestions about um, convening people, like we said around these dialogues are sometimes difficult um, and educating students so that they can counter some of the prevailing narratives. Um, I think many Catholic universities are uh, well poised when we're not in a pandemic um, to offer opportunities for experiential learning, um, which on this topic in particular, I have found um, to impact students profoundly. Um, so whether community-based learning courses where they are also um, spending time in the community with uh, individuals studying for their citizenship exams or in bilingual elementary schools um, and putting that experience in conversation with course texts um, I think has made more of an impact on my students over the years than any lecture I've given or any text that they've read you know that that spark of recognition I I've had college students in the past say you know I met with my community partner who's studying for the citizenship exam and he had just come off of two full-time jobs and wanted had the energy to do this he said you know I'm an undergrad I slept in how am I drinking in these these stereotypes of immigrants as lazy he said this person worked harder uh, just for a shot in this country than I ever have I think likewise immersion trips um, you mentioned going to the border come with me to the border um, I have found uh, some of the experiential learning um, via these week-long or uh, or other immersion trips to be quite transformative for students in ways that are not just showing up in theology classes, but then giving them new questions for their economics uh, classes, right? Or um, the classes in social sciences or in their majors that they feel their encounters uh, really provoked different perspectives and even new data uh, that aren't typically um, presented in their dominant field. So I think Catholic universities are particularly well um, poised. Again, we have some restrictions now. I've had to shift my service learning courses this semester um, to that kind of experiential transformative pedagogy. Thank you. And we'll actually have a breakout panel on this uh, very topic uh, uh, a little later today. But um, we're about at the end of our time. And um, I'd just like to give each of you uh, one minute for some 
parting remarks. Um, so um, maybe we could begin with uh, with Dan and go to Kristen and then and give the Cardinal then the last word. Dan. Uh, to me, one of the most important pieces, this is not just a political issue, this is not just a social issue or an economic issue, this is a spiritual issue. And I think what's at stake is our humanity. And I think that uh, it's, uh, if we aren't able to see in the migrant uh, somebody who is a reflection of God and connected to ourselves, then in some sense, we're the aliens. Uh, we're the ones who are alienated from our humanity. We're alienated from our brothers and sisters. And ultimately, we're, we're alienated from God. So I think, um, to me, one of the most important things that the church can offer in this, in addition to direct service and advocacy, is really helping people reframe how they really see themselves before God and in this world. And if we see Jesus himself as the divine migrant who entered into our world uh, and died on the cross to reconcile us to God and to help us in our return migration to God, then that should have implications for the way that we think about those who are on the move today. So I think what's at stake is our humanity. Um, ultimately what's at stake is our salvation. And this issue goes to the heart of salvation history, but I think um, uh, it also is, is really is trying to uh, make our world more reflective of God's reign and more reflective of who he's created us to be. Thank you. I think our conversation um, this morning and this afternoon uh, really highlights how complicated and multifaceted the questions facing migration um, policy and conditions for internally displaced uh, persons and refugees today really are. We've touched on on culture and faith and economics uh, and um, international policy. Uh, but like Dan, I do think that this is fundamentally a, a spiritual question. And I think to reframe um, these dominant narratives that are so damaging, uh, we have a lot of rich resources in the Christian tradition. Um, so I was moved by uh, Pope Francis evoking last week the Good Samaritan with respect to this World Day um, of Migrants theme. And I think certainly um, in the parable of the Good Samaritan, we're called not to simply walk by uh, or dehumanize um, or stereotype or ignore those um, perhaps on the side of the road. Um, but we're also called not like the lawyer kind of questioning Jesus to simply begin and end with parsing what we owe to whom, uh, with what citizenship status and under what conditions. Um, but really rather like the, the Good Samaritan to identify with and become neighbor to the migrant. Um, and I think that um, that call is more urgent than ever. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for this opportunity and this, um, this very fine exchange. Uh, as my concluding uh, thought, uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to go back to, to my title, um, uh, Mobility and Lockdown, and to say yes, that we, at this point in early October 2020, we are living a paradox. I, just thinking about it now in the last uh, while, it's, it's a bit interesting that while we're immersed in COVID, um, most of our conversation was not about COVID. And so I wonder if, if we uh, could take one thought away with us, uh, which is the Holy Father's, I think, very wise and in some ways shocking uh, warning, don't try to go back. And to ask ourselves now, am I actually willing to keep going? In other words, to go uh, further and deeper and better? Or uh, am I actually longing to go back? In other words, uh, as uh, um, now uh, being in the autumn, the sort of the new year, the new academic year, the new business year starts, is it really, uh, well, let's hope that this, uh, that this nightmare will soon be over and we'll just get back to what we are happy with and what we're used to. And I think connecting the question of migrants and refugees with uh, some of the other very big questions in our world, which includes the, the climate crisis and the, the galloping and, and obscene inequality, 
uh, we can't go back. And we can't go back. And I feel and fear that we are very tempted. So I, I would leave it with that uh, question. Uh, Lord, deliver us from the temptation to go back. And um, I hope this conference and many other opportunities will help us as, as Christians, as uh, brothers and sisters, as human beings to, to keep going and to keep risking so that it will become uh, a human family in one common home and not, what, not the fragmented uh, situation that we've come from. Thanks. Amen. Amen. Uh, Cardinal, we can't thank you enough for uh, accepting the invitation to participate in this conference and deliver and to deliver the Tomasi lecture. Um, it's really a gift to, to us all to have you together with us. And uh, and Dan and Kristen, thank you so much for your very thoughtful comments today. And thanks to all the participants. Uh, thanks to you all for joining us uh, for the Tomasi lecture and the discussion that followed. Um, our next plenary session will be in about uh, 20 minutes from now. So uh, we look forward to, to seeing you all then. Thank you very, very much and, and many blessings to you all.